Oil is a market that's very liquid, very deep, very global. And that means it's generally run by supply and demand trends. So what we've had here is a global economy that's slowed down. China has slowed. And when that occurred, we had a demand side shock. That demand side shock resulted in less demand for oil. At the same time, we've had a US natural gas and energy boom. So we've had a supply side shock where we've had more supply. Now, when you have more supply and less demand, the only natural occurrence would be lower price. And that's what we've seen happen. Now, the one interesting element of your question is uh, about my outlook. And here, I do think I may have a different perspective. What I found very curious was in the fall of last year, Saudi Arabia and OPEC decided to keep pumping oil and, in fact, increased production precisely when oil prices had already started falling, indicating supply was, in, uh, was plentiful. Now, why would you pump oil in the face of excess supply? And I think there's only one answer. The answer is the Saudi Arabians, as well as OPEC generally, were trying to hurt their enemies and help their friends. Now, who are their enemies? The enemies are probably Russia, because they were helping Syria, mm -hmm. and Iran. Now, these are two countries that have budgets that are highly dependent upon high oil prices. So if you can squeeze those budgets through low oil prices, that's a good way to hurt your enemies. Now, who are your friends? Presumably the United States and other large consumers of oil. Well, wonderful. You'll lower the price for your consumers, and you'll hurt your competitors. So I think that's a political call in terms of what happened with OPEC and Saudi Arabia. Now, unfortunately, I think because it's a political call, it becomes very difficult to predict with any precision when that may change. What I can say for certain is that it's unsustainable, that you will not see continued production in the face of overcapacity in the oil markets if oil prices stay this low, because budgets will not work. So that's my outlook. I think this is a wonderfully interesting dynamic. And I've studied extensively the Chinese investment bubble. Here I do think it's a bubble that occurred in China. China overinvested in the face of excess capacity. They built too much. They spent uh, a lot of money on building excess infrastructure, some of which has not yet been utilized. They've effectively pulled forward the demand for such products uh, in, in China to the present. Now what they have to do is take a pause and fill up that demand, the capacity that they've created. That means that in the Chinese investment boom has to go bust. And that means the entire supply chain of commodities that has been feeding the investment story in China also has to find a demand shock. And that means that they will have less demand. This means that commodities that go into building stuff, the industrial commodities, I'm talking about iron ore, lead, steel, zinc, copper, these are the commodities where China has been 50% of global demand. That's going to change. This means that you will have a demand side shock, which will lower prices. Now, from an Indian perspective, this is wonderful, because these are the commodities India needs. And because of China's trajectory and path over the last 20 years of increasing demand, the whole supply side has increased capacity to meet Chinese demand. I believe that the emerging market middle class is booming all around the world, whether it's in China, whether it's happening here in India, or whether it's happening in Brazil, or other large economies, Africa. And one of the things I have uh, great confidence in is that when individuals get more money, they consume more animal protein. And of course, because animals themselves consume grains, what we will see is an exponential impact on the demand for grains. Now, that puts food price demand pressure throughout the system globally. I'm convinced that this will be a bigger problem in time. Now, in the short run, what we've seen in the United States is a record crop. The United States is a big producer of corn and other commodity crops. And elsewhere, we've had reasonably uh, accommodating weather conditions, which have supported very high yields. Um, and so we've had a temporary situation where I believe supply has exceeded demand growth. I don't think that's sustainable. And I think in the long run, food prices have to go up. And they'll go up materially. And so preparing for that dynamic today is an important uh, objective. I think any food vulnerable country, and I would argue India is a food vulnerable country, uh, needs to prepare for. The one thing I will say is that we have had 
massive money printing. Let's just call it that, money printing. We can call it quantitative easing or we can come up with whatever term you wish, but the reality is there has been an artificial push down on interest rates in many parts of the developed world and the large economies, and that is unsustainable. And like, because of that, uh, many investors have pursued exposure to riskier assets, such as equities. I don't believe that ultimately the unwinding of the money printing, if it happens, can be done without creating instability. And so when valuations are full, and I would argue India has fullish valuations, you have to express caution. You must exhibit caution in these matters uh, because the underlying dynamics of the economy in India may be improving quite dramatically. But if the valuations already reflect that, then you'll be subject to greater volatility than you might be expecting. Well, unfortunately, a strong dollar is generally very bad news for emerging markets. It generally means capital flows towards the United States and away from emerging economies that are in need of capital. Now, fortunately, I believe the world is more differentiated today than it had been in the past, meaning there will be pockets where that may not be true. I'm hopeful India will be able to avoid some of that, uh, but if it isn't able to, it will affect the, some of the disruption. Uh, the disruption will come through in the form of currency moves. Uh, the dollar strength, I would argue, is not necessarily completely about the United States. Sure, part of the reason the dollar index has been strong is the United States economy is doing well. But the other reason the dollar index is strong is the rest of the world is not. Europe is having tremendous difficulties, and I've actually written that I believe Europe may not survive. You, may, you have to either have a political union that combines with a monetary union in Europe, or you will see a disintegration. Unfortunately, I think we're on the slow path towards a disintegration. And that may, in fact, have big ramifications for the world. Well, I think gold actually is very similar to currencies. Uh, many people think of gold as an investment asset. I think of it as effectively a hard physical currency. And the best way I can think of to think about gold and gold prices is to think of the gold price as one divided by confidence in central banks. And if you believe the central banks are gonna be printing money, and we see good indications out of Japan, out of Europe, and of course the U.S. is printing less money, in fact stopping that printing press, uh, whether they put it in reverse is yet to be seen, uh, but the world is still printing money. Central banks are not being as responsible as you would hope. And if you think of gold as one divided by confidence in central banks, which is a concept uh, developed by Jim Grant, a, a famous US commentator uh, who writes Grant's Interest Rate Observer, uh, then you believe that gold prices have to rise.